I've uh, structured this presentation in, uh, uh, you know, in a couple of parts. The main aim is not to have it as much technically focused, although I will be touching on the workloads that we've seen. And uh, as you'll notice, we, we serve quite a, a breadth of clients across multiple verticals. So we definitely see all sorts of different types of workloads. I do want to spend a bit of time to uh, talk a bit to the ones that are diving in that are entrepreneurially inclined and uh, share a couple of learnings that we've, we've had across the last five years as we've been developing this business that hopefully might be of use to you as, uh, as you go along with building yours. Thank you so much, Mohan. Next slide, please. <clears throat> we aim to become Canada's top qualified custodian for digital assets. Now, uh, what do I mean by qualified? There are a couple of local custodians today that if, if, you, if you call them, they can hold some of your assets and maybe integrate through programmatic API with. As far as having someone of the, of the scale or of the same quality of service as say Coinbase Custody, Gemini or BitGo, Canada still locks at the moment and most of the crypto trading platforms around here usually tend to go south across the border to work with one of them. So that's something that we're trying to fix. Next slide, please. <clears throat> To further re reiterate why this is needed, we keep sending assets south half a dozen funds that uh, are listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange today. So I'm talking about the 3IQ funds, the Purpose Funds, Galaxy, CI Investments, Evolve. Most of them have the, the, the regulatory requirements that are imposed on these registered firms under National Instruments 31103 and 81102 dictate that the custodians that they use meet certain requirements with respect to security, with respect to insurance, with respect to oversight from various financial services, regulatory bodies. Again, in, in Canada, although you might be reading some prejudices here and there about some companies that are trying to, to break into that space, including ourselves, we don't yet have anyone that can be called a viable qualified custodian for these funds, as well as the crypto trading platforms that are slowly registering as restricted dealers and then eventually full IROC registered broker dealers. Next slide, please. <clears throat> a bit about us. Uh, we believe that we're furthest ahead. So just uh, the company itself was founded back in 2017. After uh, a few interesting tryouts and a pivot, we ended up going full speed into custody in Q3 2019 when we launched. We were the first to market in Canada with such a service. And today we custody over one and a half billion worth of assets. And we are arguably the largest custodian in Canada. There are... Uh, you know, a couple of private funds, a few crypto trading platforms with a few hundred thousand users each. There are uh, over a thousand and so ATMs that we serve as well that, you know, like whenever something happens, they end up pinging our back end to transfer the assets out. And we do like to stay profitable or close to profitable as we grow in this line of business. You don't want uh, to worry about uh, where is your custodian going to be raising the next round of funding. So that's not the, we want to basically give our clients the confidence that we're here to stay for the next 10 to 15 years. Very briefly about what a custodian is, which will give you an idea about some of the use cases and workflows that we're seeing. At the core of it, we're a secure storage solution for digital assets. We offer offline wallets, managed wallets, as well as warm wallets. This is done under a bailment agreement. We take exclusive possession over the private key material by generating managing the private key material throughout its lifetime. The full legal title sits with the client. The assets are on their balance sheet, not on ours. We don't, ledge, uh, we don't pledge loan rehypothecating encumbered assets in any shape or form. And then most importantly for, for, for a business like ours, business continuity and disaster recovery is front and center. And this translates into requirements that we have with respect to cloud services providers that we use. How uh, quickly can we spin up a new customer environment? How quickly we can decommission something? How quickly we can recover in the event of a disaster of various parts of our network? Like these are questions that we ask ourselves daily and we, we run through all sorts of drills and various scenarios at regular intervals, internal game days to make sure that we're prepared in such kind of events. Next slide, please. <clears throat> We work with trading desks, market makers, liquidity providers, ATM networks, private funds, trading and exchange platforms. So we touch across quite a variety of verticals. We have clients that have workloads like I need to be able to send 30,000 on-chain transfers in the next week and they're all small size and there's no sorts of batching happening. And we have clients that say, I want to be able to move large amounts, but at infrequent intervals. We have clients that use the offline storage 
for which the private key materials, it's an offline HSM that's somewhere in a downgrade vault and that will require, you know, certain uh, uh, like SRA one or two business days until the funds can actually be loaded into one more central external address. We have clients that say, give me a RESTful API because I want to integrate my trading platform or my application with yours. And I want to be able to generate sign and broadcast transfers to blockchain networks on demand as needed. We, uh, without diving too much into details, we do use both offline HSMs as well as cloud HSMs. And I'll, I'll tell you in a bit about some of the decisions and the, the choice points and what actually drove the, the, the choices that we made along the way with respect to what we run in-house, what we run external, what we get from a vendor, what we build ourselves. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I, I did mention briefly, so I'm not going to be spending much time on this. We started in 2017. This kind of solutions don't get built overnight. It took us a year and a half until we had a prototype that we were comfortable with using internally and then opening to a couple of close beta clients. Until you put all of the backup disaster recovery and succession planning in place, independent, redundant backup systems, some vendor dependent, some vendor independent, basically want to make sure that in our kind of business, you're not tied into any particular technology, solution, architecture, or vendor. Um, again, like roughly a year and a half until we were able to go live with a first client. And then next slide, please. <clears throat> it took us a bit of scaling work throughout 2020 and 2021, a ton of it actually, and I'll tell you some, some stories from there until uh, we got to a point where, uh, you know, like these days, so last November at the top of the market, we had crossed two and a half billion worth of assets in custody. Two days after this drop, we're close to one and a half. And arguably the business finally has some legs of its own and it can uh, it can grow without again, chasing funding or doing anything of the sorts. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so just to get into uh, the, the, the interesting pieces. Number one lesson for us was uh, determining your technological core competencies early. So figure out what you want to do in house and what you're going to need to run external. And uh, what that, and just to, to, to illustrate it with a few examples, what that actually meant for us. When it comes to security of private key material, for example, the uh, end of the day, if you have the concept of defense in depth, right? If I have a system that can be electronically accessed, and connected to some public network or, or internet, I can put layers and layers of security on top of it, but eventually it can be accessed electronically, right? The uh, end of the day, uh, if you want to go stronger than that, the only solution is to, and the only solution to guarantee that you're the only one that has exclusive possession over private key material is to leverage specialized military slash government grade hardware, which are called hardware security modules. These hardware security modules are effectively a secure cryptographic chipset that's embedded into a tamper-proof, you know, EM shielded case, all sorts of protections like resin and epoxy into the, into the material. If someone tries to open the case, open the front panel, do a side channel attack, read the memory off of the, uh, you know, the cryptographic device, the device erases itself out and the location effectively gets rendered useless to an attacker. The moment we realized that ultimately this is, no matter how you slice and dice it, this is the architecture that you're going to be arriving at, which is private key material generated and managed on HSMs. It became fairly obvious to us that uh, with respect to the offline storage, we're going to have to purchase some of those and run our own software in it. The question then became into uh, what, what is available out there, what kind of vendors are available, one, for purchasing physical devices, and two, for running some of them, getting some of the same capabilities within a cloud environment for the warm wallet infrastructure. We ended up taking it all the way to working with a manufacturer or an, under an OEM model. We produce our own. The devices come with various keys and certificates embedded into the cryptographic chip from the factory setting. It shipped over to us. We initialize them and then adapt from that point on. We have full control on which version of the firmware does the chipset run, what's the whole star operating system, what software does it run, how are the integrity checks performed. So we can effectively load our full custom software suit into this hardware security modules, which is quite a bit more flexible than using general purpose HSM devices through which you interface or through PKCS to have an interface or using any sort of uh, programmable HSM devices that give you some very limited programming capabilities, usually in the form of some Java applets or WebAssembly or uh, you know embedded C sandbox environment with huge memory and storage constraints. The next uh, example that I'd wanna bring over here, sorry, go, go back to the previous slide for one more second. The next piece here, 
not to uh, uh, you know like there's there's a it, it depends on the use case of the business for us we quickly realized that for the type of business and quality of service that we want to provide we have to run our own full node infrastructure it's as 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 much as we like services such as quick node quite based cloud and it, it could you know a few others that offered managed full node services in fora if a client says I need to access the assets in your custody and I need to send them out. You know, like there's, I have a liquidity need, like this is time sensitive. I can't, the, there can never be an answer from us that is, uh, let me call my vendor and see what their support is saying because the infrastructure is down. So we did the, like the, the, the moment you, you realize and you slice and dice these pieces in your organization and it becomes clear, okay, full node infrastructure has to stay within, we can be moving that to, to a managed vendor. Hardware security modules need to be in house, we need to produce our own. And with respect to the warm infrastructure, let's try to effectively integrate the bits and pieces that we need with, in, with respect to that privileged connection, connection to the secure cryptographic chip and talk to PKC 11 through uh, to whatever hardware security module the cloud, cloud provider offers, then uh, that, this obviously imposes some constraints with respect to how you architect the rest of the system, what your costs will be, and ultimately how you manage and, and negotiate the relationships with the vendors and the cloud providers and what you actually look in terms of capability and functionality. Next slide, please. <clears throat> The next uh, important lesson that uh, we, we've learned across the years in the last five years of running this business, build relationships with the right technology partners. And when I say right technology partners, you need to take into account more than just what are the technological capabilities, which are important in the context of your own, what you determine to be core competencies and what you to some degree care less about the quality of what's being offered you will be each business you will be assessing the cloud providers that are available through their own unique lens if you run that analysis early on we've tested pretty much everyone that's out there uh, you know and we we run with uh, on pretty much like every major cloud provider that you can think of from IBM cloud to to Azure to DigitalOcean to AWS to and to the Pieces that matter to us with respect to technology partners is good support, ease of use, well documented, you know, very uh, well documented services. Like we don't want our engineers, and those are some very very expensive cycles when you think about payroll and what it takes. Plus, their frustration in in dealing with figuring out how to run the same workload that they've run a hundred thousand times on a different cloud provider on this particular cloud provider. So those are all things plus risk, as uh, Darian mentioned, uh, you know, like as a, we're in the process of getting a SOC to ourselves. So uh, it is it, it most, if you try to get one of those certifications, every cloud provider that you're going to be using most likely will be deemed to be a subservice organization and will have to satisfy certain controls or have a SOC two of their own. Like these are all important considerations to, to keep in mind when you're selecting a cloud provider. Cloud provider uh, uh, lock and vendor lock in to some degree is the real thing. It can be mitigated against, but the, the worst thing that you can do as an early stage starting business is to get going with something because it's easy and then develop more and more services on top. And at a certain point, the cost of switching and the cost of mapping your infrastructure and your orchestration playbook to run across a different cloud provider um, isn't, isn't worth the benefit. You want to start doing that work early on and you want to start automating those pieces as early on as possible. So you, you have the choice at the end of the day. What particularly just to, just to mention a bit about, uh, uh, you know, like our relationship with DigitalOcean in particular, we're a Techstars company. We went through the Toronto 2019 batch and we were fortunate enough to be accepted into the Hatch program at DigitalOcean. What we liked about DigitalOcean versus the rest of the cloud providers, and uh, again, like we, uh, like the, there are corporate partnerships and sponsorships everywhere. DigitalOcean has the most straightforward startup program, the most generous cloud credit program. They offer up to 250,000 worth of cloud credits to be used within a year if, uh, if you, you qualify uh, for the program. In the early stages of our business for us, that meant that we could test certain workloads and actually run a little bit of stress testing on the infrastructure itself without worrying about the, the monthly bill. Like there are high fixed costs and there are there, there, there is a certain degree of quality that you want to 
provide like when uh, w- when you get into business such as ours the only way that you can provide those SLAs in that level of quality is if you run stress testing if you understand your workflows and if you understand what happens at the edge when things start to break you want to do that in advance you don't want to do it into a production environment ideally you don't want it to cast an arm and a leg and digital ocean proved to be the right partner for us during those stages of the journey next slide please <clears throat> Be cloud agnostic if you can, which was uh, very interestingly mentioned in the previous talk as well. Uh, multi-cloud environments d- tend to be the default in 2022. It's, it's not about uh, replicating the same work and doing it over and over again. It's about having the choice and the ability to scale how you need when you need it to. It's from, a, from an availability and fault tolerance perspective, you don't want the cloud provider to be the single point of failure within your organization. You know, like this is, it's, it's as much aspirational as it is practical in the sense that there are obviously parts of your infrastructure that you might not necessarily be able to migrate or migrate that easily, like with a button flip in the event of a downtime from one cloud provider to another. Nonetheless, uh, if you mitigate 90% of the failure cases, so say, I don't know, some, some particular availability zone is no longer available on AWS, we have the playbook and we've tested the playbook to switch everything over to DigitalOcean within half an hour. You know, and then that's, uh, that is uh, effectively the level of infrastructure automation and uh, the, the, how you want to be building your orchestration playbook end of the day. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Be efficient with your spend, even if you don't need to. And this is, uh, you know, like at the cost of sounding like a broken Twitter account. Uh, it's, it's, it's not about, uh, like, even if you have the money, it's not about not spending the money or not deploying the capital. It's about, it, it, like, if you don't keep your spend efficient, your technological spend, that inefficiency at a business level will translate into inefficiencies at a technical level and will translate into poor architecture. I'll make it very, very specific. As you can imagine, like we had various f- full node uh, managed providers that approached us throughout the years with which we maintain good relationships because who knows what, you know, like it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's always good to see what the other side is doing. They've constantly been approaching us with respect to why don't you run your infrastructure here? We're going to give you this pricing. We'll give you this discount, this discount, like we'll give you this capabilities. If we uh, were to run our full node infrastructure less efficient than the way that we currently are, that cost benefit from a business point would have been, uh, you know, like, do I really want to be dealing with 25 different types of blockchain networks and worrying about hard forks and protocol upgrades and keeping nodes in sync and keeping high available, uh, available setups? If the costs over here are on par, you know, like with this managed provider or, uh, you know, like maybe slightly more expensive, you obviously factor in a little bit of an opportunity cost there as well. Because we run it as, as efficient as, as we are, that cost benefit never flipped for us. We still, by far and large, for our own particular needs and we understand our workflows and our, our, our throughput needs like in and out at this point. With resp- we also understand our, uh, our technological needs. This particular blockchain network needs a multi-terabyte storage uh, media. This particular blockchain network needs NVMe-enabled drives because it requires very high input-output uh, throughput. You know, at, we at all stages throughout the journey, we've managed to run our own infrastructure more efficiently than a third-party service provider. If we hadn't, at this point, would have probably been with a third-party service provider at the cost of losing that flexibility, at the cost of damaging our SLAs, at the cost of losing quality with, with the clients. So being efficient with your spend translates into being efficient and simple within your internal architecture. So that's why I'm, I'm encouraging it. It's, it's, it's a way to pile less organizational debt, which ultimately translates into less technological debt and uh, a better day today for everyone in the engineering team and everyone that's on call. Next slide, please. And the last slide that I'm gonna be touching on, uh, especially in the context of what's been happening in the crypto market in the past couple of days. Some large stable coin depicted, prices went down, things exploded, uh, you know, prices, crypto asset, the crypto asset market overall is down like 20, 30% of it. We've seen three cycles of this at this point. 
for being for five years in this business. Back in 2017, towards the end of the year, we were doing over-the-counter trading and selling at that time before the custody business was spun up. This is how we, we eventually what motivated us to get into the custodial space because we couldn't find a good custodian for our own needs. Back at the end of 2017, we were getting more inbounds from people uh, on the business than we can, we were getting more, we were, we were getting fast requests and we can send invoices out. At some point, we pulled the plug on it. We, we pulled the brakes our own and started asking these people, do, do you know what's happening over here? Like, do you know, do you know what you're getting into? Like what the, you know, you should do. refusing clients uh, is something that at the peak of a bubble might be a good thing to do. Immediately after, as you can imagine, throughout 2019, it's been a complete slump in an 84, 85% drawdown for the market overall. And it was a one year of quiet building where uh, though, though if you ever mentioned the word crypto at a dinner table, people would have were getting PTSD by how much they lost in the market at the time. So not necessarily the, the, the best place for the ecosystem to, 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 to be in uh, like mentally, but as long as you focus, you're focused on building and most importantly, understand the technological uh, uh, understand the technology, the technological breakthroughs that blockchain brought brought on. So myself, I'm an engineer by trade, bachelor's in computer science, master's in computer science. Uh, there, there are people that say they're in it for the technology. I truly am in for the technology. It's uh, you know from a from a research standpoint, the blockchain technology does is a fundamental computer science breakthrough. And that, that will never change, which means that over time, whatever that ends up meaning, three, five, seven years, the technology will get, get adopted. It was the same in 2018. It was the same after March 2020, when the pandemic hit and everything went, uh, went places, and it'll be the same now. Tough times don't last, things rebound. If you're thinking about starting a business, if you're thinking about getting involved into the space and doing something with, with blockchains and maybe trying out digital ocean as your provider. Maybe today is not the best day to you know, tell your family about it and, and get into it, but in a week from now, definitely. So don't, uh, don't wait. This is uh, the, 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 the technology itself has huge merit. There are huge efficiencies that can be gained from the systems versus running through all sorts of intermediaries. And I'm not talking about just financial application use case, but more, more broadly, even if it takes a longer time to deliver, even if there will be hype waves with the metaverse and the web three and all of that, that will come and crash and go, the technology isn't going anywhere the same way that databases aren't going anywhere, the same way that distributed systems aren't going anywhere in the same way that say no SQL, uh, 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 the database management systems aren't going anywhere anytime soon. That's what I had to share with you today. I'll pause here and uh, I'll, I'll be available for questions. Thank you so much again for having me here and for dialing in. Awesome. Thanks, George. Your last slide couldn't have been more timely given everything that we're seeing, right? And your session was really packed with a lot of insights from your entrepreneurial journey. So thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate your business and uh, um, uh, very uh, thankful that you made the time to join us today. We're going to open it up for questions uh, in a minute, but before that, we wanted to share some resources for those of you uh, who would like to explore more. DigitalOcean recently launched a blockchain guide. So if you're interested in learning more about the concepts and uh, cloud infrastructure requirements for blockchain uh, businesses, uh, go to do.co slash brt22 hyphen guy, uh, download the uh, free guide. You can also test out DigitalOcean. You get $100 worth of free credits. Uh, go to do.co slash BRT22. And if you'd like to connect with uh, uh, Darian or the rest of our solutions engineering team, they're a global team. So um, wherever you're joining us from, if you'd like to uh, get on a one-on-one -on -one call with them, speak about your business, what you're building and how, and if DigitalOcean can help, we'd be more than uh, happy to kind of assist you. Um, our team has been working with a lot of blockchain businesses uh, over the last um, year or so. And we've seen many of them scale the businesses like Quicknode and Balance. So we're excited to kind of extend that uh, knowledge from what we've learned from uh, helping some of our customers to other aspiring uh, blockchain businesses as well. Um, with that, a quick shout out to Darian's next session. This is happening on May 18th. If you'd like to understand more about Beyond Crypto, how blockchain is taking over the business world, you can tune into Darian's session next week. Uh, go to do.co slash tech talk underscore may underscore 22 and you can uh, join us there uh, with that we will now open it up for questions um, 
Um, please mute yourself before asking your question. Uh, also state your name, title, org, uh, uh, so we get to know a little more about you. You can ask any questions of uh, George, Darian, or, or some of the other DigitalOcean team members available here. Um, it would be great if you can enable your video so we'd also get to see your face. And also because this is a community event, we really request you to maintain a professional code of conduct. With that said, uh, we'll, we're now open for questions. Does anybody have a question? Uh, feel free to use the reaction button to raise your hand and I can uh, unmute you. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen so we can see everyone. Cool. I, I have an answer, crypto isn't dead, I promise you. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Great. Thanks, James. I appreciate you joining us. Anybody has any questions? George, maybe I have a question for you. Um, in terms of um, hiring, um, are there specific uh, ways that you go about hiring your team, uh, especially because blockchain is such a new and upcoming technology? Um, what are the things that you've seen from a hiring perspective? Oof, uh, if there's one thing to do, especially in this, uh, in this market, it is hiring and it is hiring on the engineering side of things. Um, you know, like we, uh, we have good, good compensation that can go as high as say 250 a year for, for someone that joins in. It's, we're still an early stage uh, uh, company, right? Uh, it, it, it is a very tough market. So what worked for us was going through our networks. Like again, uh, early employees, friends and family, past coworkers, like this is how we identify the talent, the people that have worked with us before that knew the team, that knew that we're, we're, we're serious, we're professionals and we're, uh, we, we care about the craft that ultimately ended up joining the team. For all of the, um, you know, like crypto had this ethos for a little while back in 2018 and 2019 with let's bring Wall Street in and, uh, you know, like we need institutional adoption. At some point in 2020, 2021, some of that started happening and now we're competing toe to toe with Wall Street. It's extremely tough for us when, uh, you know, as an early stage startup, we'll, we'll say we'll, we'll, we'll pay uh, we'll, we'll pay a senior engineer a quarter million dollars a year, like not uh, not necessarily as a senior staff or anything more developed. And then you have hedge funds out of New York that say, well, 400K base plus, 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 right? So it's it's very tough to, to compete in that regard. Toronto itself became a very hot uh, market in the last five years in, uh, in in general. And you have more and more companies, Web2, Web3, not just the crypto guys that are moving in. So unfortunately, like I don't necessarily have uh, more advice passed higher through your networks. Tap into some of those uh, hiring channels, your angel list, your Techstar style and hiring.com. Usually you can find good candidates that are still, uh, you know, that are skilled, that still have something to prove, which is why they're on uh, they're on from a technical standpoint and a bit of a chip on their shoulder with respect to career growth, which is why they're on those platforms. They're not uh, looking for new jobs through some executive recruiter or, or anything of the sort. So those are, uh, you know, like for us as an early stage company, we are looking for those diamonds in the rough, which have the same skill set as someone that's proven that's been in the market for a while, but hasn't lost the passion with respect to building their career and building the track record of successfully delivered projects. <laughs> 